Moving on to page 26 in our step guide, let's look at part four of step four, which is writing our sex ideal. To prepare to write our sex ideal, we first need to take inventory of our sex life. So let's read starting on page 68. Karen, do you want to do that? About sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there. But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes, perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish? dishonest or inconsiderate? Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Were we at fault? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? We ask God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised and loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? Some people tell us so, but this is only a half-truth. It depends on us and on our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm, harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. Thank you, Karen. We've got a, a statement here on the next slide, I think. Um, basically, we are taking inventory of how we have misused our sex powers in our attempt to manage our life. This whole thing we've been talking about all day about the actor trying to run the show and manage his life, well, guess what's a big chunk of what we got to manage with? Our sexuality. I, I was with some AA people one night and they were talking about this very part in the book. And after we were done talking, I was going home and 
it occurred to me that they had been talking all night about sex powers. And I had always looked at it. I mean, in, in psychology, that's what you look at, right? Sex needs. Everybody has sex needs. You've got to meet each other's sex needs somehow. And these people were looking at it completely different. It threw me off. I, what are you guys talking about? Sex powers. I got sex powers. I don't have sex needs. Is that an interesting concept that I could think about? Maybe I don't have sex needs, but I'm a sexual being with sexual power that needs to be expressed properly. And if I do that, then I'm meeting the needs of what I am. I'm being myself then. I'm, being, I'm living right. So in order to find out this whole thing about sex powers, um, you know, the idea of sex needs, here's an example. I read this in a book. Um, if, if the man is supposed to meet the woman's sex needs and the woman is supposed to meet the man's sex needs, that's like getting your needs met is like being a tick on a dog and sucking the nourishment out of the dog. The problem with this theory is I got two ticks and no dog. So I got no way to get my sex powers met because I'm just sucking off of another tick who's sucking off of me. I, I, now, that, now look, there was no puns intended there, I'm just telling you. It's part of our act. We misuse our sex powers as part of our act. So if we're ever gonna get on track with our sexuality, we're gonna have to take inventory of the ways that we've misused our sex powers. And the biggest clue is that it's hurt other people. Now, in the getting advice about sex, the book is clear. We got two sets of voices. I would say that we got this set of voices over here that cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, that it's a base necessity of procreation, no flavor, that you guys don't like sex. But I know that's not true. But I. I could look at this group over here and say, you guys are the ones that say, we don't have enough of it. It isn't the right kind. You'd have us on a straight pepper diet and anything goes. Now I'm sure you guys are in that group and I think you guys are too. We're all in that group. But the point is, hysterical thinking and advice is not what we're after here. We're not looking for anybody else's advice about our sex power. We're trying to find out for ourselves the proper use of our sex powers and integrated into how we've used it for part of our acting, for part of our selfish managing of the world. If I'm the kind of person whose reputation is crucial to my sense of self-esteem, I'm apt to misuse my sex powers in a way of trying to keep that all together. What would I do? What kind of things might I do? I might not be very assertive. I might be, have a hard time being masculine. And if I'm the kind of guy that really, my whole way of operating is to just be in charge of everybody and everything, you know what? Maybe I go around being pushy with it all the time. But either way, we're looking at how we have misused our sex powers based on whom have we hurt? So we let God be the final judge. We avoid hysterical thinking and advice, these two opposite groups. If our conduct continues to harm others, we're quite sure to get drunk. In this way, we shaped a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. So the purpose of this inventory is to end up with a sex ideal, which would be, the next slide, our chosen sex ideal, after our review, taking into account the ways we've misused our sex powers, we write a paragraph to describe our chosen ideal use of our sex powers going forward. Always keep in mind, if our conduct continues to harm others, we're quite sure to drink. So the inventory itself is listed on page 26 here, and it says we do this. We reviewed our conduct over the years. It doesn't say we make a list of all the relationships we've ever had and analyze them. It says we reviewed our conduct over the years. And then we ask ourselves these questions. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate? This is in our notebook. 
selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. Tell me about being selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate with our sexual powers. Withholding sex. Now, why would somebody do that? Well, withholding sex might be a way of manipulation. So it might be a way that we manage our world. Um, I was uh, talking to a woman at A one time, and she told me that, look, I don't have to take my sex inventory because I've been married to my heart, high school sweetheart the whole time I've never had any other sex partners. I asked her, so you've never used sex to try to manipulate your husband? She said, oh, well, maybe I do need to take my inventory. So that's what we're talking about. How else can we be selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate using sex power? Having sex with someone who's not a true candidate of being the future Mrs. So-and-so. Okay. So misusing people for our selfish purpose. That, that would be a manipulative thing, too, inconsiderate in that I just want to use you for my own purposes. That would be a misuse of our sex powers, according to this. Selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. Who else has one of the ways that... How does a man misuse his sex powers? Okay, that's very inconsiderate. Rape is what she said. That is the ultimate of using somebody else for your own whatever reason. It's a bad act. Cheating. Say it. Cheating. Cheating. Yeah. Okay. Infidelity. Infidelity. Selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate. Cheating can fit that. That bag. So we write down the ways that we have been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. The ways. It's not like we don't necessarily even list all of our relationships. We just write down kind of our nature, the way, the, well, not our true nature, but the way we have misused our nature. Were you had something to say, Michelle? Well, women use it for a place to live. And to manipulate security. Correct. And both sexes use it for self esteem. Fill in the blanks. What do you mean using it for self esteem? I think being with a certain um, status of person, if you feel less than, if you can find somebody that you feel superior to you and they're with you, that makes you, that you get esteem off that, you feed your esteem. Okay, or, or if, I, if I have your yielding to my sexual desires, then I have your, you, your condoning that I'm a valuable person and I, I think I have self-esteem. Sure. Okay. And when you say to manipulate security, that's how I wrote it up there. So, go ahead. Uh, um, trading sex for financial security, a roof over your head, um, a car to drive. I think that it's gold digging on either both sides, women or men. Okay. So these are ways that we, we actually just stop and look at, how do, what do I do? What's my, mo, what's my style here? How do I use sex in selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate ways? Were you done? Did you have something else? Okay. Now it says, 
Now that we've looked at how we misuse our sex powers, let's say that a, that a person is, doesn't feel like they're really adequate and up to life. They really think they need somebody to take care of them. Could you see how they could easily misuse their sex powers as a, to, to make themselves more attractive to the person that they need to take care of them? Or let's say that a person is the kind of person who really needs to be needed, that wants to be needed. Now, this is looking like a match made in heaven, these two people. One of them needs somebody to take care of them. The other one needs to be needed. This is good stuff. So this is like the two ticks and the no dog is the problem. But this, this person gets his sense of self-esteem because this person is needing them and very open to them sexually. The person who thinks they're not enough is often very open sexually, maybe too open. So that's the idea. Now, after we get this all done and we see the nature of how we have used sex in our acting, in our attempt to manage the world, is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only uses his sex powers properly? Well, that's not exactly what it says. If he only manages well. But we could plug if he uses his sex powers properly into that equation. The next question is, whom have we hurt? Now we make a list of people. This is actual names now. The people that have been hurt in our past, the wreckage of our past, by us use, misusing our sex powers. The next question is, did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Why would somebody do that? What's, how does that fit with our act? Unjustifiably arousing jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness. Is there such a thing as I could get reassured that you really are here for me if I can get you to be jealous? If I see that you're jealous, I know that you really like me. Maybe I even have self-esteem if you're jealous. That kind of thing. So I go around tweaking you a little bit just to see if you can get jealous. Where were we at fault? So this is question one. That takes several pages in your notebook. Question two, question three, and at fault. Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? What should we have done? Now we're getting closer to understanding what we want to do in the future. So I look at where have I been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate? Who got hurt with me doing that? Have I been going around trying to make you jealous to see if you like me? Where have I been at fault? What should I have done instead? Now, I get this all down on paper, and the purpose of getting this all down is so that I can look at it and come up with a proper ideal for my future sex life, which is a paragraph for how I would like to behave if I can live up to it. This is what I think would be best for me to do, the proper expression of my sex powers. Does anybody have an idea of a couple of things that might be on a sex ideal? I'll take something that JR said a minute ago. Well, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to try to just get something from somebody 
unless j just to get it, I'm, I'm only gonna move into a relationship that I think is reasonable. Truthful. Like if she's not eligible to be mine, why would I be trying to get something from her? I'm just using her if I'm doing that. Yes. Right, you're talking about two ticks without the dog, right? Yes. So my, like gravity, I have believed that relationships are for people to affirm each other, support each other, to provide all of these, all that third column stuff you were talking about, self-esteem, emotional security, financial security, ambitions, personal relations. I've always thought that that's what these relationships are for. And part of my ideal is uh, now instead of entering a relationship to have somebody support me and take care of me, is that I'm entering the relationship to share the abundance of blessing that I have, the abundance of esteem that I have, the abundance of security that I have. Of course we support each other in the process, but I'm okay if my partner is not able to meet whatever, quote, need that I have at the moment. I'm. I'm an, an adult individual who can take care of himself. And so when I enter the relationship with that attitude, it changes the type of partner that I end up with for sure. You know, so I was going through these relationships with people and it seemed like I was getting hooked up with the same type of person over and over and over again, even though that wasn't the kind of person that was good for me. And what I realized is that I was attracting that kind of person because of my beliefs of, around what relationships were about. When I changed that was when I started attracting a different type of mate. Okay. And or maybe God changed it. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Yeah. So, like in our resentment inventory, we're toying with the idea that possibly other people don't have the power that we thought they had over our self-esteem and everything. And then in our fear inventory, we're toying with the idea that possibly who we are is enough and we're gonna know what we need when we need to know it. We're toying with that. And in our sex ideal, we're toying with the idea that if I am truly myself, that's good enough. Being honest, being truthful, being direct. Men are masculine. How many men try to tone that down so that they don't scare you off? That's not honest. If you're really masculine, be mad. Oh, I want to be masculine if that's okay with you, you know? Uh, no. That's what I am. I need to take a chance with it, being masculine. What about feminine? Feminine is scary. I mean, I'm vulnerable when I'm feminine. If I re feminine is about being responsive and submissive. Yikes. What kind of bad language is that? See, in our culture, it's like, don't just be yourself. Don't just be feminine. Don't just be masculine. You need to tone that down so that the, you're politically correct with these guys. And you need to tone it, you know, be careful so that you don't get taken advantage of. And it's like that. It is a big mess. So what we're, our ideal is about, all right, I'm masculine or I'm feminine, independent, and I am wanting to be honest. I'm not wanting to hurt anybody. I'm not, that's the, that's, that's the indicator that it's BS is when it's hurting other people. So my ideal, now I had a guy come to me one time. He said, hey, I want to read my sex ideal to you. Okay, she's blonde. She's 34. She's five foot six. You know, she, he starts reading all this. He, oh, this isn't the ideal woman. This is the ideal use of your sex powers, dude. So it's a different thing. So what do I want to do? I want to be who I am. 
I've discovered who I am through all this inventory. I've discovered that my self-esteem is real. And that's why this sex ideal is at the very end of the inventory, I think. It's because it's kind of like a summary of how I want to act in relationships. But again, I'm just toying with it because I don't know if I could live up to this or not. It's pretty scary for a man just to be the masculine person that he is. It's pretty scary for a woman just to be the feminine person that she is. And then there are women who are extremely feminine to the expense of their strength and their sense of, see, women and men, I think, both have both aspects to some extent. A man that can't be submissive or vulnerable is a man who's too tough, maybe, if there's never any room for that. And the woman who can't stand up and take charge on occasion is maybe a woman who's too frail. I don't know. That's, but that's why we avoid hysterical thinking or advice. So if I sound hysterical in my thinking and advice, don't listen to me. This is your inventory. This is your best guess of what God wants you to live in your sex life, your sex powers. Write it down and try to live up to it. And if you decide it's off track, fix it. Write it again. But the idea of it, the, the sex inventory in my book isn't just about beating myself up for being a bad sexual person. It's to discover a better way to be. I'm, I'm writing all this history down. Well, for one thing, I'm writing down people that I've harmed, and I'm going to need that later in the steps. But I'm also trying to understand how I want to move forward. After getting this all down on paper and reviewing it, we then write a paragraph to describe our chosen ideal. In other words, we write down our best understanding of the proper use of our sex powers based on our past failures and successes. Would you read uh, the step four summary to the end of the chapter there, Karen? If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are now convinced that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Big chunks of truth about myself. Is it possible that my wife has nothing to do with my self-esteem? Is that even possible? That's a big chunk. Is it possible that I'm going to know where the snakes are at if I start living this way of life when I need to know? Is it possible that my sex powers are there? I don't have sex needs. I have sex powers digesting some big chunks of truth about myself. Okay, let's move to step five.